funding for the interview show with Mark Baser is provided by LifeWay, makers of LifeWay Kefir and other probiotic products, like their Kefir Cups, non-dairy sparkling elixir, and supplements. LifeWay, love your guts. Visit LifeWayKefir.com. Blogonitas, beer speaks, people mumble, except on the interview show. And Field Notes, vintage styled, made in the USA, pocket notebooks, journals, and stationary products. Visit FieldNotesBrand.com. My first guest is a poet, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and a former U.S. Poet Laureate. Here's Natasha Trethaway. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, in reading your poems and in watching on YouTube, and everybody should do it, there's several speeches or lectures that you gave as Poet Laureate uh, that are excellent. There was, there's so much I want to ask, but I want to start with something very basic. And that's in, in, I think it was in a lecture you gave, in which you talked about the necessity of poetry. And so that, is that for society? Is it for the individual? Is it for both? And if it's for the individual, how do we all get there hmm. if we're not there? Well, I absolutely think it's for both. Um, I have actually said, I think, in some of those lectures that I think poetry might be the thing that saves us. Um, poetry is a way for us, both as um, a society as well as individuals, to connect to each other across time and space, to be reminded of how we are alike and not that we are different. The intimacy of a single voice speaking to another that um, makes you feel like you're entering a space that um, is welcoming. I think, how do we get there as individuals? I mean, I, I, I imagine that one of the things you might be asking is, like, why should anybody read any poetry? Or if, there, if people don't read poetry, how do we get there as individuals thinking that it's something that should be a necessity or matter for yeah. us? Yeah, and I think it's a little bit like when I was reading your books, I realized, quickly that I had to slow down. Mm. And I'm so used to reading the magazine or New York Times and just being like, got it, got it, got it, graph, 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 and it's written that way. And even the spacing of the words on the page in, in your poetry and obviously other poems mm -hmm. makes you say, hey, wait a minute, buddy, slow down. And that's hard, that's hard to do. Oh, well, that's right. I mean, poetry does ask that we slow down and be more observant um, and more empathetic. It, it, it sounds like you were reading it the right way, um, because there is a way that, yeah, yeah, there is a way that you know, you you can read, you could read poetry quickly. I mean, lots of poems, I, and I think mine are like this, aim to be accessible on the surface so that you can, you know, quickly sort of read what's going on on a surface level. But you're right, there is something that's saying to you, there's more than that and that you have to read differently when you read a poem and you slow down and think about what else the words mean. If you're sort of reading always on that kind of uh, primary definition in the OED level, then you're not really reading a poem because you've got to go secondary, tertiary, and on and on and think yeah, about the figurative yeah, levels. Yeah, right, <laughs> well, of course. I mean, and, and the way that a poem does that is by slowing you down with line breaks and space and breath and the way that, you know, when you're really sort of taking the poem into your body, you're taking it not only in your intellect and heart, but you're taking it with breath and um, with the rhythm that you might tap out if you hear it with your foot. You mentioned something about kind of poetry having the ability to cross time. Mm -hmm. And so many of your poems and so many of the overall themes of the collections are making connections between present, perhaps your life, perhaps not, and, and the past. And past in sometimes surprising ways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've read many, many poems. You read them, if you read them in isolation, it might just be about, it could be about this, the mug on this desk, and it could be absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. But what is it about memory and the complexities of memory that, that obviously like, inspires you so much? Well, I think 
What I'm interested in in terms of the complexities of memory, of course, we know that um, as we remember things, as we tell stories about our own experience over and over again, we're re-remembering them every single time. And because of that, they're, they're changing a little bit. Um, we see that right now with cultural memory. Um, I feel like when I was working on Native Guard, um, I was thinking very much about historical memory, cultural memory, um, the stories that we tell ourselves as a, a group, as a culture about the past. And here we see ourselves having debates about our past. Uh, and that's what Charlottesville is about. That's what all these uh, debates about uh, Civil War, uh, post-Civil War monuments and monuments to the Confederacy are all about memory how we're going to remember and what story our memories are going to tell about us as a, as a nation. So you're from, or spent a lot of your early life in the Mississippi Gulf area, mm -hmm. Gulfport. Mm -hmm. You've spent a lot of your life in the, in the South, including the Deep South. Mm -hmm. You've talked about how Gulfport and Mississippi, on the one hand, has been a place of such ugliness and yet you still love it. Well, I, I love my South. Um, it's the place that made me. Um, I don't think I'd be a writer without all of the complexities and the trauma and the very ongoing difficult things about this place that I both love and have every reason, if I'm a smart person, yeah. to hate. You say Mississippi, and you're quoting Auden, mm -hmm. I believe, and I would never know, how, know that unless you had actually quoted Auden and told me you were doing that. Um, but you said Mississippi hurt you into poetry. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Auden said to, about Yeats that Mad Ireland hurt him into poetry. Certainly, my the madness of my Mississippi and my South, um, with its sort of terrible history of injustice and racism, but you know, in a larger sense, our, our whole nation hurt me into poetry. Um, Why was poetry the avenue for you? You know, sometimes that I feel like I, that's a hard question to answer. And it, it, it may depend on when you ask it what I might say. So I'm answering it for the first time, I think, again. Okay. Um, I think a lot of people turn to poetry because it seems like a kind of special, um, sacred even, language that feels different than the ordinary language that we use to communicate with each other. People who may never read poetry will turn to poetry in difficult moments or in moments of extreme joy, moments when they want to try to convince the beloved of their devotion uh, to commemorate the birth of a child. They turn to poetry because somehow poetry announces itself as special. And this is where you have to turn because no other language is going to be able to do it. I turned to poetry when my mother was murdered when I was 19. I hadn't been a poet yet. Um, in fact, I, I tended to write short stories back then. But it wasn't a story that I needed to write to try to contend with that feeling of grief. It was a poem. It was a bad poem. But I only believe, I believe that only poetry could contain something of that grief. And that's been a subject that you've, that you've relied on poetry. You've come back to it. You've come back to the story of, I mean, that's what Native Guard. Native Guard is, is both about a, a regiment, uh, an all-black regiment in the Civil War, and it's about wrestling with, with your mom's life and, and obviously her brutal death. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is an intertwining of those two things about um, national and personal memory and about one's native duty as the child of a woman to remember her and one's native duty as a citizen to remember truthfully the history of our nation. On a lighter note, you were the <laughs> National Poet Laureate. What's that gig, like, 
is, do you go into an office? Are there benefits? <laughs> like, what's, how does that work? Well, you know, so that no one complains, the first thing I need to say is that it is not paid for by anyone's taxes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Poet Laureate ship is endowed by a private, uh, the, the, what, whatever small budget there is, is um, an, a private endowment. Okay. And that's just for programming, if I want to put on yeah. readings or something like that at the library. Um, you know, before it became the laureateship, which happened in um, 1986, Congress changed the title of it. It used to just be the consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. And that was a real job. It was a, a librarian's position. Yeah. But when they changed it, it just became this kind of honorary position. Um, and the laureate wasn't asked to do anything in particular except sort of be an advocate for poetry in America and give a reading to open the library season, uh, one to close it at the end, um, and choose uh, some poets to win a, 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 an award. But in my first term, I decided to, to kind of be old school, and I was, I was thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks, because Gwendolyn Brooks of Chicago was the last consultant. Um, and she was in her office every day, she wrote letters uh, responding to all the child school children who wrote to her. So I decided to move to Washington for half a year and take up residence there and hold office hours in the Library of Congress so I could meet with the public to talk about poetry. That's awesome. Yeah, well, great. Thank you so much for meeting with us. Thank you. Natasha Trethewey, everyone. Hey there, viewer. What's even better than a talk show in a bar? How about a talk show at a rooftop bar? Yeah, but okay, what's worse than both? How about a talk show on the roof of a bar that doesn't have a rooftop bar? Introducing The Interview Show on top of the hideout roof. Without a net, without a clue, without an audience. Guests on the interview show all share one thing in common. They take risks. We'd like to thank Lifeway, makers of probiotic kefir, for making possible this week's It Takes Guts interview. My next guest is an architect, the founding principal of Studio Gang, and a MacArthur Genius Award winner. Here's Jeannie Gang. I was driving today to here, the hideout, and I'm driving down a street in Chicago called Ashland Avenue. And right near where you where your offices are, yeah. actually. And I started to think about how you set out to often bring urban and the natural environment together in a natural way. And I thought, my god, I'm on this street where the you're lucky if you see a tree. And the trees, I looked at one, it was pathetic. It was a terrible tree. And it's not the tree's fault, it's our fault. My question is. How do you move forward at a time when cities have already been established? They're urban environments. They are away from nature, or we designate where the nature goes, like Central right. Park. Well, um, what's really interesting now is that um, there's actually even more biodiverse nature in city environments than there is in, let's say, the suburbs. Really? Yeah, because in the suburbs. Because that's all like buffalo wild wings? <laughs> it's just, you know, monocultures of grass lawns and things like that, whereas we have a lot more wild things going on in the city along the waterfront, et cetera. So, so we're trying to cultivate that. Actually, right on Ashland Avenue, or where our office is now on Bosworth and Division, yeah. uh, we have what we call a sky island on our rooftop. Okay. And it, it's... Um, it sounds amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's a stopping point for um, insects, birds, et cetera, for, for, with a lot of different types of plants that they like. So, you know, if can you're an animal. Can people go up there? Yeah, people can go up there. We're animals, too. I understand that. <laughs> you know, it's funny, my, 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 my younger son always says, he wants to play this game in the car, when he says, I'm thinking of an animal. Uh -huh. You have to guess what the animal is. And then we give, come up with, he, we ask him, yeah. like, is it a mammal, is it this? Kind of like 20 questions, but it's gotta be an animal. Yeah. And every time when it's my turn to choose, I choose a human. And he gets so mad at me. He's like, is it a human? I'm like, yeah. He's like, not a human. We're not animals. But, but we are. And I'm going to tell him that you said that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. definitely. Yeah. We, yeah. Do you have a, a favorite animal that you like to 
besides a human. Oh, besides a human. I mean, um, that they, I like? do you think that you are? Like, you know, your, your, alter, your alter ego kind of Oh, God, I didn't, think, I didn't think that you'd be asking me this tonight. <laughs> uh, I, love, I, I love the whole cat family. Hmm. <laughs> I'll try again. I love dogs. Yay! What about you? What animal would you be if you were not a human? Well, we have this thing where we assign different animals to people depending on what they remind them of in our in our office. Really? Yeah. So different people are different animals. Like my partner Mark is an ant. Okay. Because he's really yeah. strong. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, what are you? or people pick their own animal. Don't evade the question. <laughs> what are you? Well, they, um, I don't know if this one fits, but they called me a unicorn. That's cool. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, yeah. I um, I don't they like, don't think you're real. I don't like pink, they think, though. What's that? I, I don't like pink. But so I, don't, I mean, I feel like you could ha a unicorn could be any color. Yeah. So what do you do with what do you once you've assigned these animals? Like in my office, we have job titles, <laughs> <laughs> which I admire you. <laughs> what do you what do you do with what do you do with that? What do you do once you've been told that you're a unicorn or an ant or? Uh, you just kind of like assume some of the characteristics and play that role a little bit, I guess, and then. You know. What's your favorite um, material these days? Oh, mm, probably these days wood. Really? That's just like classic. What is what? Because it can do. It's it's alive. It, because well, it's like it's a live material that absorbs carbon during its lifetime. Okay. You know, and so then when you put it in a building, it's just sequestering the carbon, really. But all different kinds of wood that we're using, and now even um, designing a high-rise and wood structure. So these are really... No way. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to ask you about that because you don't, you associate high-rises with, I guess, steel or yeah. other metals. Yeah, concrete, steel. But, How does but that, now I mean, the, the engineering is such that you can, you can actually go higher and it, it actually has really good uh, resistance to fire that lasts long and the, the integrity of the materials stays while it, you know, if it ever burns. But so it's, it's getting more prominent and once we, I think, the idea is that you want to have buildings be zero carbon eventually. Yeah. And that's what's so beneficial about it. That's what's about. great about wood, yeah. So when did, it, when did it actually click? When did you, did you go to, you obviously went to school for architecture, but when was it, this is what I want to do? Probably after differential equations <laughs> that I was like, I'm not going into engineering. Yeah. Um, no, I were, seriously, I was um, studying, I did a study abroad program, and so I got to travel to Europe and I were and I had classes in in cathedrals while we we're talking about the history of it and I, I just I think I loved that it was um, a field where it's it's such a reflection of culture and you know it's it's really our culture is our architecture it's the cities that we build it's the buildings that we make so I do want to ask you about a few buildings oh. that I think you have going on what's this place in New York City where it incorporates the sun somehow. Okay, we're designing a building along the High Line, which is the elevated park in um, New York. Yeah. And um, the first thing we found out was that, you know, this zoning envelope that they give you is, you know, it's, it's like creates a pointed building, which is kind of cool, because that's why all the buildings look step back skyscrapers in New York. But the thing is that logic did not apply to our site because we have like an interior block, the, the, the interior park, which is the High Line. Yeah. So we, we argued to step it back the other way, the opposite way, because it made sense, and to carve it based on the sun angles so that the light would still get to this High Line park. And otherwise, if we didn't do that, it would have like killed all the plants, you know what I mean? And I don't want to be a plant killer. Because it casts shadows yeah, on, it would on the have ground. Yeah, it would have cast shadows on this part of the park. So, so instead, our building is um, shaped and sculpted for these sun angles and views for people on the High Line Park. That's amazing. And it's in construction, so. And you're also trying to figure out, or you have figured out, a way with a tower to not harm or kill, I guess, kill birds. Is that true? Yeah. How? Well, there's, um, it's, it's kind of complex because, but 
to understand what, what happens with the way birds see buildings and or don't see them um, is a lot of times it's because the glass is too reflective and too like mirror like and they don't see it they just see the reflection of the sky so they crash into buildings yeah. something like I don't know 93 million birds every year die crashing into window glass that they can't see in North America only I mean yeah. that so so it's a lot and it's like you know that's another thing about buildings that we want to address and change because they shouldn't they should be supporting the environment and not like hurting it so we've been studying ways to make the buildings more bird visible and how do you do that I mean have you figured yeah. it out yeah there's a couple things one is um, making the building visually active like like the aqua tower for example it has a lot of texture and solid uh, reading to it so you can see it um, and then if you have sometimes if there's glass on you know like two sides of the building are glass and you can see through there birds think that they can fly right through there so then you can put small patterns on the glass frit on the glass and that is visible to them so a lot of the stuff I've asked is stuff that I can go to. I went saw some stuff that you did at the that was at the Art Institute a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. I can read about it in newspaper or magazines. I can see the building either in progress. What is kind of what's on your mind right now that that that's kind mm. of keeping you up? That's yeah. that's three years from now. It's going to yeah. be and now we're doing this. Yeah, like things that are on the boards or things that are in our minds right now is um, one, one aspect is thinking about um, how we can increase the reuse of, of buildings, reuse of materials, reuse of old buildings um, for new uses and, and to try to create an industry around reuse because right now it's, it's very difficult to, to do. Um, and so that's one thing that we've been thinking about a lot, and that will help to reduce the carbon footprint of the buildings. Um, it's also interesting, though, and I think you're talking about something yeah. a little bit different, but when we think of architecture, oftentimes I think we think about moving forward. We're moving yeah. forward as yeah. a culture, which often involves the tearing down. Yeah. But reuse, by definition, yeah. includes taking into account our right. history. Right. I think taking down buildings is, is good sometimes. But what if we could take them down and just like you do recycling of your your materials, you could recycle all the materials in the building instead of throwing it into a landfill. Yeah. So that that's the the next um, generation is like maybe demountable buildings or building because every building is going to have an end and then it will need to be. Um, Deconstructed. Not the hideout. Not the hideout. <laughs> Please, not the hideout. Um, but yeah, so you cities grow. You want to build bigger and make them accommodate more people. So yeah, so what are what are the best ways that we can think of to do that? So it's not just you know dumping stuff out and having it end up in a fill. Jeannie, thank you <laughs> so much for for that answer and for coming on on the show. Thank you, really Mark. It. It's been great. Jeannie Gang. <laughs> Thank you. We were traveling the country for the first time. We were going to ta cities and towns for the first time, meeting new people who would come out of the woodwork and go, man, we heard your record on the radio. We love we're like, well, really? Okay, great. And then we'd sleep on their floor and hang out at their house, and there were girls and fun, and, and, and then another, another town, and it was like being a... It's like being an apparition who would just appear and party and then play and leave. It was amazing. I was leading a Tuesday morning Bible study in my high school when I was starting to come out to friends. Uh, and I was pretty chill about it. I mean, it, it was, um, I, I started telling people, I got really excited. I remember I used to um, deliver flowers for a florist and I would, I would ride around I've never told this story. I don't even think privately, let alone publicly. The but interview I, show. But I used to... Uh...
Funding for the interview show with Mark Baser is provided by Lifeway, makers of Lifeway Kefir and other probiotic products, like their Kefir Cups, non-dairy sparkling elixir, and supplements. Lifeway, love your guts. Visit LifewayKefir.com. Lagunitas, beer speaks, people mumble, except on the interview show. And Field Notes, vintage styled, made in the USA, pocket notebooks, journals, and stationary products. Visit FieldNotesBrand.com.